Hello, I'm Lisa and this is Scene on 7 on WMTV. Here's Steve Brennan. Hello and a warm welcome to this week's Scene on 7. I'm Steve Brennan, cosy and warm, in fact very warm in the studio, but some of our presenters have been out braving the elements, some a lot braver than others. This week, Tony O'Rourke tries keeping up with the joggers in Burnham, our charity spotlight falls on asthma sufferers, Bubba Mitchell meets the champions of chiffon, it's not fashion, it's ballroom dancing. Author Robert Elegant tells his traveller's tales to Karen Mooney, Andy Catterall is making Britwell more beautiful. My studio guest this week is Alex Brown. Has he got what it takes? What silly things were you up to for children in need? Now, if you drive around before most sensible people get out of bed, you'll see them pounding the pavements, sometimes in some pretty extreme weather conditions. They are the joggers. We waited for the coldest day of the year so far and sent Tony O'Rourke along to Burnham to meet them. But Tony... Did the bubble car start? I've always wanted to do a piece on the Lotus Esprit, but today we're talking to the Burnham Joggers. Since we did the rugby recently, I'm blue. Today we're at the uh, Cherry Orchard Memorial Ground in Burnham in Buckinghamshire where I'm talking to Burnham jogger David Rodwell. Hello, David. Morning. Tell us about the Burnham joggers. What are they? Burnham joggers uh, have been in existence for about 16 years now and we're in the village of Burnham in Bucks. Uh, we are primarily a jogging club as against an athletic club. So we encourage all levels of jogging, road and cross country. In, how, in many you, how many of you are there? Uh, currently, at the moment, we've got something in the order of about 180 members. Really? That does include juniors as well, uh, people as young as six years old. And you go out on a day like today when it's freezing, minus two? It's only minus two today, but uh, we have been known to go out much colder than this, certainly. Yeah. Presumably, once you get going, it, you, you heat up, do you? Yeah, you tend to wear gloves, etc. You wrap up warm, we wear thermal insulation, and um, once we do get going, after a couple of miles, you, you get warm. You wear special shoes as well. We do indeed, yes. Dependent on which type of running we're doing. What's the difference between ordinary trainers and the, the jogging shoes that you wear? An ordinary trainer has not got the right amount of cushioning in. It's not been designed technically correct for road running. Uh, there are also cross-country shoes, which are slightly different again, which have less cushioning but more grip. Right, little spikes on the Little bottom, spikes yeah. or little studs, like a football boot, almost. Right. I've heard varying stories from different people about how good jogging is for you. Some people tell me that it's very good for you, and others say that it's not very good for you. Well... For the heart. For the heart. For the well, heart. Is that I, right? I can tell you that um, something about ten years ago, I was diagnosed as having angina. I was playing squash at that time fairly extensively. Uh, my doctor advised that I should take up cycling or light jogging. Um, for the last nine years, I've had no symptoms of angina and I am off medication. Now, I put that down to better eating, less red meat, in fact, no red meat, no flesh at all, um, and uh, steady jogging, steady road running. Right. You've got a special event coming up quite soon. It's an annual oh, event, isn't it? We have a wonderful event coming up soon. This is the Cliveden Cross Country, sponsored by SGT over at Taplow. It's a six-mile cross-country event. In, the, uh, in Clifton House grounds, which are the former home of Lord and Lady Astor. That's National Trust property now. That is National Trust property, yes. Uh, it's a very interesting course. As far as the runner is concerned, it's very testing, very hilly. And in order to enter that, it's open to everybody, is it? It's, it's open to all runners, bearing in mind the difficulty of the course. I wouldn't um, anticipate a new runner coming along 
But if you've certainly done any cross-country running and you've run a few hills, then you're certainly welcome to come along and uh, enter on the enter within the race. Are you also looking for new members for, for the Burnham Joggers in general? We are always happy to accept new members. We have a wonderful clubhouse just east of Burnham at the uh, George Pitcher Memorial Ground, the Cherry Orchard, it's known locally. And uh, if anybody comes up on a Tuesday or Thursday evening and talks to myself or any mm -hmm. of the runners, we'll give them a warm welcome. Right. There's a phone number as well, isn't there, for entries? Phone number for entries for the SGT Cleveland Cross Country. Yes, if you ring 0753 647339, we'll be happy to send you an application form in the post. I must say there are no entries on the day, so if people do enter early, bearing in mind the Christmas post, etc., we'd appreciate it. Well, David Rodwell, thank you for talking to us. I'd love to speak to you more, but I'm absolutely freezing. You're welcome. I must go now because I've got another run to do, so <laughs> I'll see you. Rather you than me. Bye-bye. And if you want to get in on the action, the SGT Cliveden Six Mile Cross Country Race is on the 27th of December. You can get an entry form by ringing 0753 647 339. This is a very cold Tony O'Rourke in Burnham Beaches in Buckinghamshire returning you to the studio. We had hoped to see Tony doing the wheelies in the Lotus, maybe next week. On the subject of cold weather, please remember that the elderly and the frail are particularly at risk at this time from hypothermia. So can we remind you once again to be a good neighbour and check on them from time to time. There are some basic guidelines, such as making sure they wear several layers of thin clothing and having plenty of hot drinks available. If you know anyone who may be at risk from hypothermia or you feel that you may be at risk yourself, you should contact your local social service office immediately. Grants and allowances to help with the heating bills are available. So don't worry, help is available, just stay warm. Asthma is a terrible affliction and tragically it's on the increase. So what is asthma? Pat Pope has details. Today I have with me three people who are involved in some way with asthma. The most chronic disease in the Western world today, killing about 2,000 people a year. For example, in a class of 30 children, three will have or have asthma. For my first guest, I'm going to talk to Beryl Shearn, who is the regional contro controller for the Bucks, Barks and Oxford area. Hello, Beryl. Hello, Pat. Now, I know that you are the regional controller, but I believe you've been involved with asthma campaign for 20 years, is that right? Yes. yes. Can you tell me wh how you became involved to start with? Well, we originally became got involved because our daughter has asthma and we wanted to learn as much as we could about controlling asthma. She's now, of course... She's now 28. Yes. What are the mo most common causes, Beryl, do you know? The most common causes are chest infections, exercise, um, cold air, and allergies. And these can start any time, yes, start an attack? Yes, asthma can come and go at any age. Now, you cover a very large area. Yes. And so, what would you say was the percentage in the area of cases? Well, there's a, we cover the whole, the, the, this local branch covers the whole of East Berkshire, yeah. and there's some 330,000 people, and 10% of the population will have asthma. Really? Yes, it's about 10% in children and 5% in adult, adults. Well, how, how do you cope with, uh, you know, seeing all these people, I mean, fund-wise? Well, the National Asthma Campaign is a national charity, and every penny we spend, we have to first raise. And th in the past year, we have spent about a million and a half on research, and about £400,000 on educational material. Really? Yes. Yeah, well, so we have a network of branches all throughout the United Kingdom, about 190 branches in all, and they actually are run by local committees, and they raise funds for the, use, the work of the National Asthma Campaign, and they um, hold educational meetings. Now, I believe that the, this figure of 2,000 could be cut greatly yes. by 80%. We firmly believe that with um, education and understanding, correct use of the medication, that the death, the number of deaths a year could be cut. Really? So now, how, um, what is your greatest need as, as um, a society? 
Well, our greatest need is to, to start local branches and therefore we need local committees and then they can get out in their community with and educate the people in the community to understand asthma and raise funds for research. So you need volunteers? Yes, absolutely, volunteers. So where would one contact you if they felt that they would like to well, help? Well, they, they can contact me for the local or they can find our address at libraries for the local branch contact or they can contact our head office. So you have a national number? We have, a help. We have two numbers. We have our national office number for general information and then we have a very important number which is our asthma helpline and that is 0345 010203 which is very easy to remember. Thank you very much for that information, Val. Very nice of you to come along today. Thank you. Hello, Victoria. Hello. How old are you? I'm nine. Nine. Now, I believe that about five months ago, you were starting to cough. Would you like to tell us about it? Well, I was having my swimming lesson, and um, my teacher heard me wheezing. So at the end of my lesson, he told my mum, and he said, has she got a puffer? I, and I think he meant an inhaler. Mm -hmm. And she said no. So we went to the doctors, and he prescribed an inhaler for me. I see. Now, how often do you need to use the inhaler? Well, I use it when I have an asthma attack to ease breathing and just before hard exercise such as swimming. I see. And have you had a few attacks since then? Yes. So you've been able to take your inhaler. Mm. Now, do you, do you feel any pain at all when you have it? Mm. It's not really like a sort of pain that you think of pain as, like a cut sort of pain. Right. But it's sort of a tight pain. A tight pain in your chest? Yeah. and then you have a little puff of that and it helps. Mm. Now they've been talking about two inhalers, a blue one and a brown one. Do you know the difference between those two? Yes, the brown one you take just before you go to bed and just as after you've woken up so that it's to prevent asthma and the blue one, as I told you, is before hard exercise oh. and when you have an yeah. asthma attack. I see. Now, you're a very keen swimmer, I believe. Yeah. So that's very useful, isn't it, to have? Yes. Right. Well, you have to be very careful that you take it everywhere you go, won't yes. you? Well, thanks very much for coming to see us today. And uh, I good luck with your swimming, Victoria. Thank you. OK. For my next guest, I would like to introduce Daphne Lyne, who is a chest, a retired chest physician, and is in fact the medical advisor for the local branch of asthma. Uh, Daphne, we've talked a lot about asthma today. What exactly is it? Asthma is wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, dry cough. But the most important symptom is wheezing. Is it painful for the the chest tightness can be uncomfortable, but it isn't painful. So what medication is offered to the sufferers of asthma? The important things are the inhalers. If people get occasional attacks of asthma, they just need to use an inhaler to relieve that attack. But if people get asthma several times a week, they need to take preventers regularly. And it's important that they do take it every day without fail. And it's important also that they are shown how to use the inhalers correctly. I see. The technique is so important. So are there any other drugs available to people? There are other drugs, such as steroids and theophylline drugs. But it is the inhalers that are the very important drugs to be used, both for prevention and for treatment of asthma. Yes. For children and adults for alike? For children and adults, yes. yes. Is there a cure? There's no cure, but we are working on it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money in research, and we hope eventually one day there will be a cure. Is there an inherent fa factor here 
Can it be There's inherited? There's no, no direct inheritance, but it tends to run in families. Really? So anybody watching this program today, what message would you like to give them? The important thing is to use the inhalers early and to use them correctly. And regularly? And regularly. So that if they didn't have a, an asthma attack for, say, a month, they must still continue to use the, it daily? To use it every day without right. fail. Well, thank you very much for giving that information to us. Thank I've you. I've learned a lot today. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Pat. For more information on asthma, call the Asthma Helpline on 0345 010203. A nice easy number to remember, and the telephone number will be available on the moving magazine, which is available to you 24 hours a day. Okay, now dances around the world are like fashion trends. They come and go. There's the mashed potato, the twist, and Saturday Night Fever, to name but a few. But ballroom dancing, the satin, the white tie and tails, just keeps on going. They take it very seriously. Bubba Mitchell, WMTV's very own Ginger Rogers, checks it out. In a change of pace to last week's nightclub aerobics, today we're going to be looking at the more traditional ballroom dancing. And we find ourselves in the Slough Community Centre, where they're hosting the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Open Dance Championships. And I'm actually wearing a frock, and I feel very underdressed. How do you find a partner when you're actually... How do you, how do you road test it your partner? It, it, it was very interesting. Uh, my wife told me that you mustn't sit at home for two and a half years. You must uh, begin to dance in a game. And uh, she finds me a partner, and we dance for four months. We only four months da uh, dancing couple. And and how did you do in the competition today? Uh, second. How long have you been judging these competitions for? Over 20 years. Over 20. And are you a professional dancer yourself? Yeah, I was. You were. Too old now. Yeah. Yeah. What are you looking for when you're judging the competition? Well, you see, all judges look for different things. That's why you don't have just one judge. See, if, if, all, if we all look for the same things, you'd only need one judge. So you have to have a, a group of judges because we all look for different things. We all have different things that are, are our priorities. Right. You know, in good couples, when you get really top-class couples, really good couples, you look for bad things because there's so many good things you're looking for something bad about their dancing. Now, when you get bad dancers, or poor dancers, or beginners, most of the stuff, they're just beginning, so you're looking for anything good about their dancing. Organized today with your wife Blanche, and there are a staggering 37 categories that you've actually organized. That's correct, yes. That must have taken some organization. How, where did you start? It takes weeks to organize in the back room, you know, like any work does behind the scenes. So you list it up and then go through them. It takes a while. Ballroom dancing is obviously as popular as, as ever, but what do you think is the underlying appeal of ballroom dancing? Well, I think it's the spirit of competition in this case, like tonight. Lots of people dance socially, but those involved in competitions go into it like runners or swimmers or tennis players. They mean it and they go for it. At what age do people start really getting involved in ballroom dancing and Well, they start today at two and a half years, believe it or not, two and a half years old. They learn all, all the ten or twelve different rhythms in each dance. That's when they start, or two and a half, three years old. And they carry on then through meta test into competitions or they develop into social dancers. What we've seen today is obviously quite a competitive environment. Where, do, where could people go if they wanted to just have fun and ballroom dance? Well, like the same as our school here in the centre. We run a class on Monday evenings for the adults. They come along, they socialise. They just learn easily to get round the floor. 
and the same for the juniors on the Saturday classes. And there's outside places where they can go to dance in different schools that way. They're practice nights. <laughs> Congratulations, you've just won the biggest cup I have seen for a long time. You must be very pleased. Yes, we very. are very Hub pleased. The moon, yes. <laughs> now, I gather you've been practicing a long time, so it must be well deserved. How much do you actually have to practice? Well, every night. Practically every evening, yeah. About a few four hours. hours. That's quite a long time. Yes. Now, tell me, what was the cup that you've just won actually for? What category? For the Latin American. Amateur. And I also won one for the Miss Elegance. And I must say, you did look incredibly elegant on the floor. I mean, you must be very chuffed with that one as well. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of standard precision, your posture. That's, that's the most interesting for to show off to the audience and things like that, and, you, and judges, of course. So, so Miss Elegance isn't just for the fact that you're wearing a lovely dress. It's actually a lot to do with posture. Yeah. Yeah, makeup, of course, yeah. hair, everything. Well, well done. That is absolutely brilliant. Congratulations, and I wish you all the best in the future for future competitions. Thank you. Thank you. This is Bubba Mitchell saying goodbye from the Slough Community Centre and the Dance Championships. Everybody's abandoned us to go and sew back on their sequins, so it's back to Steve. I don't know about you, but I'd love to see Bubba with sequins on. Maybe it'll be on the Christmas show. Don't forget, if you'd like to get your message on screen, come and say hello to us. We'll be at the Queensmere Shopping Centre in Slough on Saturday morning. That's the 11th of December. We'll be there with our cameras, so come and say hi. We'll see you then, and Simon Brandt and I will be at Nicholson's Walk in Maidenhead on the same afternoon. We're back in just a few moments. Whatever you're looking for to furnish your home, look no further than the... Within our giant store on the Bath Road, Sippenham, the choice just has to be seen to be believed. Just look at the names we have under one roof. And with interest-free credit on some items, this is the ideal place. Whatever your taste, whatever your style, there's only one place to come. 388 to 389 Bath Road, just off Junction 7. It's the ideal... Here's Steve Brennan. Welcome back. And now, update on seven. This week's update on seven tackles the very contentious subject of pub signs. What else? Can you believe that a Labour councillor in Middlesex has written to the landlord of the Georgian Dragon pub in Usley High Street on the subject of the sign outside the pub? Now, the tradition of amusing pub signs goes back ages. I don't know anyone who's offended by them, but one in particular, depicting a nagging wife holding a rolling pin over her husband, prompted this comment from Labour's Ruth Willis. In this day and age, after a wealth of research carried out into domestic violence, child abuse and rape, it is proven that domestic and other forms of violence are carried out generally by men towards women. Your sign, therefore, helps quite blatantly to enforce the untruths behind the stereotypes and myths surrounding domestic violence, which shows women as the aggressor in any relationship. We find your sign ill-conceived by its location, offensive in its concept, and an affront to the majority of the people. What a load of nonsense. What do you think? What a load of nonsense. We all think the same. I thought pubs were for a nice, quiet drink, and personally, I'm on the side of landlord George Adamson. He says that it's a fun pub and a fun sign, and I'm not taking it down. I haven't heard that hounds chasing stags at pubs like the Stag and Hounds have been accused of cruelty to animals, and it's staying. The world is definitely going mad. Would you like to travel the world, write about it, and get paid? Robert Elegant has done just that. Today I'm at the home of Robert Elegant, the author and foreign correspondent, and we're going to find out a little bit about his life, times and places so far. 
I understand it started, your, your love of Far East started when you initiated an assignment to Hong Kong. Well, yes. No, I, I, in effect, I sent myself to Hong Kong by being very, very stubborn and saying I wouldn't do anything else. This was, I'd taken a master's in, degree in Chinese and Japanese, and then I went to journalism school at Columbia University at, in order to get a job. Well, I was offered a couple of jobs, actually, which, uh, but uh, the fellow called me up and said, Could you, when can you leave for Washington? I said, I don't want to leave for Washington. I want to leave for Asia. Eventually, I ended up working for the same fellow a year later in Asia. But uh, yes, I, it, it wasn't luck. I was very determined to do what I wanted. It was just plain stubborn, I suppose. And that's when you love Hong Kong? Well, uh, no, I'd already been studying Chinese for a long time and, uh, and, and Japanese as well. I sort of... I backed into it. I started out thinking, well, I don't want to... I was studying a, a course which would have led to medicine, and I decided, look, I don't really want to be a doctor, you know. I, I want to write. And I made the mistake of thinking that it was a, an advantage of journalism to be able to write. It's not. Sometimes it's a disadvantage. But mm -hmm. at any rate, and I thought, well, then how do I make a living? Well, obviously, journalism. And, but I don't want to start you know, on a provincial paper or something like that, I want to start as a foreign correspondent, which everybody said was absolutely ridiculous. Well, so I studied Chinese, and later I came to study Japanese. I thought, well, you know, if I got the languages, I'll have a better chance. I still had to carry on and, uh, and push and push and push till I got set myself to Hong Kong, but I did start in the newspaper business as a foreign correspondent, which is fairly unusual. It must have been absolutely fascinating. I mean, you've obviously traveled very widely through Asia and things. And what do you, would you say would be the one thing that stands out during your war correspondent days? Well, I, I could say the wars, I suppose, because they were most dramatic. I spent most of my time, one of the reasons I studied journalism was because I, you know, I've always been, my life has been a pull among a number of things. You say three things. First, Asia, and, and, an, uh, and scholarly, academic interest in Asia. Second, journalism, which is great fun. You know, where else do you get paid to go somewhere yeah. you want to go, ask people impertinent questions, and then write exactly <laughs> what you think of them. It's wonderful. And the third one was I'd always wanted to write novels. So it's always been pulling back and forth that way. And, but I suppose from a, for, but I found that I was, that I'd given up. I have all my, you know, I had all my credits for a doctorate, but I decided I wasn't going to go ahead with write a dissertation. I was bored of it. I was bored of the thought of going teaching somewhere. And uh, so I wanted to go into journalism. But I found that I spent most of my time sitting outside China. American correspondents weren't allowed in, and those correspondents who were allowed in didn't get very far either. Yeah. This is until the last 10 or 15 years. It was very difficult to cover. So it was it was, a, it was you know, like reading tea leaves to a great extent, except you, the tea leaves had a lot of meaning. But at any rate, uh, I found myself doing that primarily for a long time. This was the one thing they made me keep coming back to, because I suppose, because of my background, I was a little better at it than most people. But the thing that stands out most, I think, is the wars. Naturally, the most dramatic thing was the wars. They always are, and the Korean War. I mean, I practically grew up in Korea. I think I was 22 or 23 when I became a war correspondent, which I think it's still happening today. You have to be a damn fool. It's better if you're a young damn fool than an old damn fool. Absolutely. And, but uh, Vietnam, I think. I was in Malaya during the emergency. Not Malaysia, but Malaya as it was then. And uh, I've been to elections in the Philippines, which had more casualties than, than some battles I've seen. You know, 13 dead people on the floor of the police station. I'll always remember doing one election in the Philippines. But I think Vietnam. Vietnam, to me, because I'd been to wars before, therefore I wasn't overwhelmed like so many of my colleagues by the horror of war. You know, this is this business, with the latest film, the latest book that reveals to you the terrible horror of the futility of war. Yeah. Well, it is pretty horrible. It isn't necessarily futile. Some people do rather well out of it. Uh, but the I was able to go beyond that, I felt, and, you know, deal with the human aspects of it, not just the gore. I, I didn't, so I spent most of my time in both Korea and in Vietnam with the people who are fighting the war mostly, not the Americans, but with the Koreans and the Vietnamese. So it was a different uh, approach to the war, that, and it, it made a very deep impression on me. Um, we've, we've just, the last few months, we've both been in both China and Vietnam, and uh, I found that I, the emotional impact of Vietnam was still greater than anywhere else for me. And do you think the people have changed? Do you think the, the, the 
feeling in the country has changed since the Vietnamese War? No, I don't think your feeling in Vietnam. No, yeah. it hasn't changed at all. The Vietnamese people originally were, 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 were delighted to have the Americans for two reasons. The first place, the Americans brought them a lot of prosperity. Yes. And the second thing is that they didn't like their South Vietnamese government, which was very corrupt, but they liked the communists even less. The, the direction of the, you know, yes. the, the voting with the feet, the, the movement was always towards the South Vietnamese side, not toward the North Vietnamese side. Well, I went back to Vietnam and I found that the one thing they wanted above anything else in the world was to have the Americans back. This is everybody from the Prime Minister down who said, yes, we want the Americans back desperately because they, the, the whole idea is that America will bring prosperity again and in a sense, we, the Americans have won the war because Vietnam is trying very hard to become a capitalist country yeah. now. It wants to be a, a capitalist dictatorship, which may or may not work. I don't think it will. But, and I mean, in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, the taxi cabs, which the locals can't afford because, the, you know, it isn't very prosperous, although it's better than Hanoi, the taxi cab meters are in dollars. Oh, yeah. And the prices in a number of hotels are in dollars, yes. So, I mean, the dollar is the currency because the dong uh, is too, fluctuates too much. Right. So, uh, very interesting. No, the attitude hasn't changed that much. Um, um, what, what made you decide to write your first novel? Well, as I said, I'd always wanted, I suppose, to write novels. And uh, uh, in a sense, the journalism was an evasion of it. It was also a way of eating and an occasional bottle of champagne as well um, but I the first novel I did I was working for Newsweek in Germany and that we had an argument and they said well you know you, you must think about whether your future lies with with Newsweek and I said well yeah I want to think about it for a year after about six months they were saying well come back home with all is forgiven I was not on leave with pay incidentally and I wanted to write a novel and I did a novel which incidentally was set in Vietnam it was a thriller called a kind of treason which was set in Vietnam and again it was I was, I was timid about this, really, because, you know, you sort of back into real novels by starting with a thriller, which is a very fixed form. Yeah. So I, and I just, I'd always wanted to do it. I did. I wrote two books. Uh, we went to Mallorca. We committed the ultimate cliché. We went to Mallorca to write, so I could write a novel. And I wrote a novel and a half, finished the other one. The second one was a book called The Seeking, which I think I showed you the, the German edition yes, has just been published and I'm rather pleased about it. It was a long time ago, but it's always nice. To, it's one of my favorite books. Oh, yeah. Do you find sometimes the, that your fictional books um, encroach on your factual books? No, actually. Well, yes, up to a point, which I'll come back to. But really, the problem is the other way, which is that the factual books, the fact the facts tend to encroach upon the fiction, particularly when I write about Asia. And every book I've written, except my last one, has been about Asia one way or another, a number of non-fiction, but uh, also, I think, six or seven fiction, I'm not sure. But the trouble was that I tended to get too much history, too much fact into it. And I had, yeah. You know, I had one editor who didn't know anything about Asia. She was a Chinese-American girl, but she didn't know anything about Asia. And she keeps saying, what does that mean? And why does it have to be there? She was very helpful to me because I tend the thing about a historical novel is it the history has to be there, but it has to be felt rather than thrown at the reader. Yeah. And uh, this is true of Scott, Dumas, and so on. That you, a fair amount in the history is accurate, but you don't want to throw it at the reader. So I, that, my problem has been the other way, except for a book called a Pacific Destiny, which was a non-fiction ex, ex, exposition of the present state of Asia where I decided look it's all very well to be full of knowledge about Asia but the point is to get it across so I used my wife and myself and our travels as a central thread to hang it on so I suppose that was an intrusion of the fictional or use of the fictional technique oh nobody wants to come it's the Chinese least of all obviously I mean the Chinese people of Chinese race or culture who live there they're the last ones because most of them are the children well, the grandchildren yeah. now of uh, people who fled. Absolutely. Uh, and it, you know, it isn't so. It isn't communism is a meaningless word now. It's a totalitarian regime, a very intrusive totalitarian regime. That's what it really is. Well, I think we'll look forward to reading Dynasty Two. Good, and uh, Bianca's there now. Yes, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. What a lovely way to earn a living. It's the pinnacle of any broadcaster's career when he gets to talk about poop scoops. And this broadcaster is no exception. Not the poop, just the pinnacle of the career.
The free trial of XL Pet's Easy Scoop system ended on Monday the 29th of November in the borough, and responsible dog owners will be able to purchase poop scoops from the cash desks at the Town Hall Maidenhead and York House in Windsor. The Easy Scoop comes complete with 20 bags at a cost of $1.99. A pack of 50 bags will cost 99p. The packs will also be available from the Tinkers Lane Depot reception. This refurbishment is complete in January 1994. Poop scoops are just one part of the borough's campaign to promote responsible dog ownership. Other initiatives include installing 100 dog waste bins in parks and open spaces throughout the borough, and an ongoing educational campaign in schools. This will be carried out by the council's dog wardens. Dog owners everywhere take note. Here we go. Don't know what I'm getting so excited about. I mean, it'll only be once round the block. I'm longing to go. Oh, no, women. More embarrassment when he doesn't clear up after me. Yuck. Well, well, well. I might get him trained after all. Fancy a bit of a walk? Oh, um, uh, <clears throat> um. So there you are. Don't let your dog go to a tree and do it, will you? Andy Catterall has been to Britwell, braving the cold and, in fact, planting trees. Thanks, Steve. Hi, my name's Andy Catterall. I'm here today on the North Britt Estate in Slough, where the people from the Groundwork Trust have organised a community tree planting event. <laughs> With me here in the North Britt Estate is Richard Gibson. He's one of the project coordinators for Groundwork Colm Valley. He's going to tell us a little bit more about what's happening here. Our philosophy of, of our work is involving local communities and improving their environments. We're here today on this very cold day to plant a thousand trees to help brighten up the Northborough estate. We've leafleted the whole estate, we're expecting a good turnout today and hopefully whoever turns out they'll put their name on a tree and that tree will grow 10, 15 years later on they'll, they'll be able to recognise their own tree and it'll helpfully brighten up the estate. The mayor, the mayor of Slough, she, she supports the work of groundwork on, on the Northborough estate. She's, she's given us a lot of support. She'll be planting uh, a couple of symbolic trees, some nice species that will uh, hopefully stand out and uh, make a, a really nice little corner over to my left here. So can you tell me why you've given up your Sunday morning to come out on this cold day? Indeed, well, simply just to make the place uh, well aesthetically for the people who live here. Obviously, to screen out the factory buildings. Uh, just to improve the environment where people live, rather than just in uh, beautiful areas. It's just as important to, you know, where people actually spend most of their time needs to look as good as where the beautiful areas they want to go on their days out. I mean, if you, spend, if you live here, that's more important uh, to have a nice area than, uh, or just as important, as preserving the areas such as uh, national parks. You get involved a lot with these sort of... Uh, not so much with the Groundwork Trust, uh, but other, other wildlife organisations like the West Harps and Middlesex. I'm involved with them. Uh, but obviously, uh, days like this and tree planting projects, it's a good way to just do your bit, really. Yeah. Well, there's not much stuff to do around here, and, like, we could play, like, games and then like play army and things like that and something for the dog <laughs> yes with me now i have tim bissett he's one of the project coordinators of the groundwork trust and can you tell me a bit more about the work of the groundwork trust not only locally but on a national scale yeah um, uh, groundwork is an interesting organization it's a national organization our central um, office is the groundwork foundation which is b based in birmingham there are something like 33 groundwork trusts up and down the country, stretching right from um, Manchester and Liverpool right down to, to Plymouth and way down into Cornwall. Carrier Groundwork Trust is the furthest westerly. There are also some new groundwork trusts just setting up in London. The nearest to here is the groundwork trust in Camden. There's also going to be a groundwork trust, um, we hope, in Hammersmith and Fulham. So it's an expanding network of charitable trusts. From what you initially set out to do, what have you actually achieved from your initial goals? Gosh, we, we've been in operation now for about seven years, um, and the Trust has expanded both in the area that it operates under and the kind of work it does. Each year we plant something like 
um, 10 or 12,000 trees, the ones we're planting today, are just a, a tiny amount of the number that we plant. At any one time, we've got between 40 and 50 projects on our books that, uh, that we're working on, and that's expanding each year. Um, our, our aims are still to improve the environment for the benefit of local people. Well, it looks like everyone's had a great time here today in Slough. And thanks for the work of the Groundwork Trust, there's a few more trees in the Britwell area to brighten up the estate. And back to Steve in the studio. Thank you, Andy. A leaflet has been produced by the Windsor and Maidenhead Community Woodland Project. If you haven't got a copy or you'd like more information, please ring Linda Wood, yes, that really is her name, or Maurice Budden on 0628 773 890. The phone number will be listed on the Moving Magazine service. Time now for a break. Back in just a moment with my special guest, Alex Brown. Power. Electrical installations for your working environment. Controls. Control systems for air conditioning, heating and ventilation. Communications. Communications for voice and data networks. Power controls communications from concept to completion. Think pens down on 0474 853 222. Now back to the studio with Scene on 7. Poops, poops. Poops, poops, too. This week sees the release of a brand new single called That's What It Takes and a very warm welcome to the man who sings it, my special guest, Alex Brown. Alex, welcome. Hi, Steve. Tell us all about this new single and CD. Well, uh, it's my debut single um, coming out this week. It's called? That's What It Takes. That's What It Takes. I'm Alex Brown <laughs> and it's soul music, basically, soul dance music. Um, go and buy it. Go and buy it, all right. How did you get started in, in music? I've been singing in bands for years. Um, my first band was called Macho Frog, little old rock and roll blues and all that sort of stuff. Unforgettable name. Yes, not many people, for, not many people forgot it. You know, it stuck around for a bit. It was good fun, and I've been singing bands ever since. Right, and you wrote this song, I understand. I did indeed, about two, two and a half, three years ago. What inspired you to write That's What It Takes? Basically, the song's about the things that are good in life for me. Such as? Sex, soul, <laughs> of course. money, power, um, everything that makes me what I am, basically. Money and power and sex. And sex and you soul. You heard it first. Um, who inspired you when you, were, when you were quite young and you were listening to music at home? What sort of music did you listen to? Mum and Dad. I mean, there's a bit of James Brown in there, there's I a little have bit to say. Of, a little bit of James Brown in there. Um, Mum and Dad brought me up on rock and roll and blues and soul. In the last few years, I've been listening to a lot of Wilson Pickett, Solomon Burke, and of course, James Brown. <laughs> I saw the dance move in the step, you know, the one where you do the dip. Oh, yeah, I do the splits. Yeah. This is your first single. Yep. And obviously the, the ultimate thing is, is to make an album. Um, have you written all the other songs for the album? I must have about three albums worth of material now. Not all of it, as wonderful as this. But um, I've got a, hopefully got a second single coming out in January, February next year. Which called is called? Supernatural Love. Right. Plug, plug. Plug, plug. Um, and hopefully just carrying on from that. If the sales go well, people like the video, people like me. Well, we're going to see the video for this one in just, in just a moment. What's, uh, what are your plans for perhaps some live dates or something in the next few months? I'm doing a lot of PAs at the moment right. in uh, clubs up and down the country. I've been down to Bath, Bristol, Edinburgh, Dublin next week. Um, and I'm also gigging live with a band called The Rhythm Method, who were. Uh, <laughs> Sex is important in your life, isn't it? Um, now and again. It's an integral part of life. After all, we wouldn't be here if um, it didn't if happen. If it weren't for sex. Mm. Absolutely right. Now, we've got some, uh, some prizes to give away. We've got, two, uh, I think, three videos and three CDs to give away. Yep. We need four CDs. Four CDs, I beg four your pardon. CDs. And three videos to give away. We'll yep. give those to the winners of, of the competition. Tell us about the competition. What is the question? Basically, the song is all about what things make me go in life. And there's various keywords all the way through the video and all the way through the song. Um, name me four of the keywords in the song. Simple as that. And we've mentioned them several times uh, during this chat. A couple of times, yes. Maybe the different ones towards the end of the song. 
It's all about this song. Introduce us to your new single and your new video. This is That's What It Takes. I'm Alex Brown. This is the new video. <laughs> Alex Brown and his new single, a man with a big future in the music business, and you saw him first on WMTV. Now, what makes a nation go senseless at this time every year? People sitting in buckets of custard, baked beans, and allowing wet sponges to be thrown at themselves. Yes, it's children in need. The charity which is closest to the nation's hearts, more so than just about any other. This year, at the John Nike Center in Bracknell, they did it all on ice. Judy Osborne, 
the lady who's pulled this event all together. Now, what's the response been from local companies? It's been very, very good. Local companies are always very good at helping us out with charity events. And as you know, we've got some very high-profile companies here donating an awful lot of money for children and having an absolutely fabulous time. Now, this is a large project. What's been the hardest thing in I, pulling it all together? The hardest thing in pulling it all together really has been making sure that we have a programme that runs very, very smoothly with no pregnant pauses, something that um, there's a competitive feeling and people can enjoy and it's visually appealing for the TV cameras as well. Now, there are local companies here. Is there much rivalry involved or is it... Uh, Absolutely, <laughs> because um, back at the Cooper Beach Hotel where we've been putting things together, it's really been quite funny listening to all the teams on the phone saying, well, we're going to beat you, we're going to beat you. And so, you know, there has been real competitive feeling and the teams do take it very, very seriously indeed. Now, last year, Berkshire raised um, about... £140,000. And we hope we're going to top that. And I should imagine from this event and what we've been doing at the Beach Hotel, um, we should raise at least £10,000. And that, that's just guessing. Perhaps it would be more. So how much money do you think you've raised here today? So far, we've collected £824. What, just in the reception area? Just, well, no, the whole rink. The whole in the whole rink, yes. But right. we're still collecting. Okay, and uh, are you actually having fun while you're doing it? Because you don't, you haven't got a smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> you got our face was crap, really, with all this makeup. I didn't realise tights could be so cold. <laughs> Okay, you're having fun here today. Yeah, then. having a great time. Apart from the injuries, of course. Yes, but we're having I've a great seen time. That. You've got a great big bandage. How did you do that? It was the obstacle course. I fell under the um, pole and banged my, my chin on the ice. Right. So it's quite serious. Just three stitches and it's fine. Three stitches? <laughs> yep. Right, but you've got a smile on your face. So. Yeah, I feel much better. Now. And you're still going back for more? Definitely. Another Adele uh, person here. Now, I noticed that your colleague actually had an injury. How dangerous? Out there on the ice? Oh, it's nothing, nothing really. It's just uh, a bit of a laugh. I mean, if you're not careful, you fall over, you hurt yourself. But I mean, everyone's going to have bruises in the morning. It's no worse than an average Saturday on a rugby pitch. <laughs> yeah, but she's not a rugby player, though, is she? You haven't seen her in action. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our reporter there, Melanie Waring. For more information, the total for this year so far is a staggering £12 million plus. And if you raised any money, by whatever means, well done. It's almost Christmas and the Royal Mail have asked us to remind you to use the postcode on all your cards and letters. If you can imagine that over Christmas Royal Mail Slough will handle more than 20 million items, you can imagine the problems. You can check the postcode of any address in the country by phoning the postcode inquiry line on 0345 111 2. That's 0345 111 2. You can find that phone number on the moving magazine 24 hours a day. Our address for your information is seen on 7. P.O. Box 7, Slough, SL3, 6ET. That's about it for this week. I'm Steve Brennan for WMTV and Seen on 7. See you next week.